Welcome back everyone. Today we will do October 20 Physics Unit 6. Please stay with me in the video because I have used short forms of the answers and symbols and if you hear the whole explanation you can easily identify which answer to actually write or how to write the answer in our exam paper. So this is a very common experiment of measuring the, the velocities and hence the momentum of our gliders. So the question asks us how can we assured that our air track is horizontal. We know that if we place um, our spirit level on the air track and if the air if, if the air track is horizontal then the bubble of the spirit level will be in the center. Please take a moment to read this question. Here we are not measuring the velocities to find the conservation of momentum. Rather we will understand that momentum has been conserved if, if this equation is satisfied that is t2 is equal to 2 times of t1 so let us divide our t2 and t1 values and see if t2 by t1 is equal to 2 that is if our value satisfy this equation so t2 by t1 for this value for uh, 2.06 similarly for these other two pairs we have found our t2 by t1 values the average t2 by t1 value is 1.96 which is approximately equal to 2 so we can say that our values have satisfied this equation therefore momentum has been conserved a student suggested using a piece of card that is twice as long what happens if we use a twice as long card the time taken will double so we know that uncertainty is equal to the precision by the measurement so if the measurement doubles and we know that precision, precision always remains the same then the uncertainty will become half uncertainty reduces to half Here we have a very short description of a radioactive experiment. The question asks us to describe a more detailed experiment. We know that for any radioactive experiment, first we have to measure the background count rate. Then we have to make sure that our source and our detector are in a straight line. If not, then the detector will, will, detector will measure a value that is less than the actual radioactivity. The distance d has to be measured with the meter rule, so that is obvious. Multiple values of the count rate has to be measured and then the average has to be calculated. But that is not all. After measuring our count rate, we have to subtract our background count rate to get the corrected count rate. Then we plot a graph of corrected count rate versus distance. Take a moment to read the question. We know that magnets align with the natural magnetic field of the earth. If we do a small displacement, if we give a small displacement to this magnet, it will oscillate. So the question is asking us, how can we make the oscillation as accurate as possible? So if you oscillate something, if you put something into disturbance, then there are secondary oscillations or oscillations that we don't want, like oscillations in the vertical plane. We only want you to oscillate in the horizontal plane, right? So in order for the vertical oscillations to die out we have to wait for some time and this time is called the stabilizing period so we start the oscillation and wait for some time until the oscillation has stabilized and then we know that the oscillation happens for a very short amount of time therefore we measure the time for 10 oscillations and then divide the value by 10 to get the period and the entire process is repeated several times and the average value of the period is calculated So here we have our experimental setup. So we know if we want to vary the current in our loop, then we either have to have a variable power supply or we need to have something which will change its voltage across the wire. So our power supply is DC and it is not variable. So we can't do anything here. So we can add a variable resistor so that we can vary the voltage across the wire and hence the current in the wire. Okay. So explain why plotting log t against log i would test the validity of the relationship. So our relationship for uh, time and our i and n is t is equal to i to the power n. But plotting this sort of graph could be tedious. Therefore we take log on both sides and we plot log t versus log i. If you plot log t in the y axis, log i on the x axis, then according to y equal mx plus mx general form, we can identify that n will be given by the gradient. For plotting log t and log i, we first have to find the values of log t log i. The value of t and i are given. You only have to use your calculator to find the values of log t and log i. I have already found these values. 
I have not plotted the actual graph. I have just shown how the shape of the graph could be. So these are the negative axis, negative values of log t. These are the positive values of log i, and your line will look something like this. And you can find the gradient of this line using the formula y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. After finding the gradient, we have just identified that our value of n can be directly found by using the gradient. So n is equal to the gradient. We found the gradient from our graph, and that is exactly the value of our n. Please mind it that all the all uh, in all questions, the value of our parameter might not be exactly equal to the gradient. We might have to multiply a minus one or some other constant. But in this case, our parameter is exactly equal to the gradient. But keep in mind and check whether our parameter is exactly given by the gradient, or we have to do some additional calculations or not. After drawing the graph, we notice that there is an intercept in the y-axis. So this corresponds with this value, with this parameter k. If we take log on both sides again, we have our initial, we have our original expression that we plotted, plus we have another term that corresponds to the plus c term in y, y equal to mx plus c, and this is valid because we indeed had an intercept in the y-axis. You can see this more clearly when you actually plot your graph. Please take a moment to read the question. We want to measure the inner distance and we know for measuring small distances, small distances like the thickness of a wire, we can use the vernier caliper or the micrometer screw cause, or, uh, although the micrometer screw cause is a bit more precise. But for measuring inner distances, we have to use vernier calipers or digital calipers. So this is the instrument that we use for measuring the value of A and the value of B. So explain one technique. Here technique means a good experimental practice that is used for getting accurate results. So we know that we have to check for zero errors and how will that help us? Checking for zero error helps us to eliminate the systematic errors. Okay. So we have found the values of A and the values of B using our Bernier caliper. Now we have to calculate the area. We are assuming that it is a rectangle. So the area will be given by A into B. We have found the area. But the challenge is in finding the uncertainty. Since the two values are in multiplied form, so we can, uh, the, the, the percentage uncertainties can be added. I am repeating, when the two values, when the two parameters are in multiplied form or divided form, then we can add their percentage uncertainties. And when the values are in added or subtracted form, we add or subtract their absolute uncertainties. Keep that in mind. So first we have to find the uncertain percentage uncertainty of A, the percentage uncertainty of B, and then add them together. So the percentage uncertainty is given by the uncertainty divided by the measured value into 100. So the uncertainty for A is 0.01, the measured value is 0.47, and this is how we find the percentage uncertainty in A. Similarly for B, add them together and find the percentage uncertainty in our area. Now for the absolute uncertainty, we multiply our percentage uncertainty with the measured value. And that gives us an absolute uncertainty of 0.02. Calculate the shaded area. What is the shaded area? If you recall from our diagram, the slots look like this. That is, we have a cutout slot over here. Our masses look like this. So there is a circular area. From there, we have to subtract this slot area. So first, let us find the full circle area. The full circle diameter has been measured as 3.81. So using that, we can find the full circle area, that is 11.4. And we found in our previous part that the shaded area, the slot area is 1.03. So subtracting this slot area from the entire circle area gives us the shaded area, that is 10.4. Calculate the uncertainty in the value of the shaded area. So now, as the shaded areas, uh, as the shaded areas, are now in uh, we have found the shaded area by subtracting this full circle area by subtracting the slot area from the full circle area and since we have subtracted the values therefore we will uh, we will add their absolute uncertainties so first of all we have to find their absolute uncertainties the percentage uncertainty in d square is given by the precision divided by the measurement into 100 okay the precision of our binary caliper is 0.005 the measured value is 3.81 multiplied by 100, you get the percentage uncertainty in D, only D, not D square. For finding the percentage uncertainty in D square, you have to multiply the percentage uncertainty by 2. Similarly, if the exponent here was 4, we would have multiplied the uncertainty by 4. 
So that gives us the percentage uncertainty in our d-square that is 0.26%. Now, we have found our percentage uncertainty. Our absolute uncertainty in area is our percentage uncertainty into our value that gives us 0 0.03. And our absolute uncertainty in the shaded area is our absolute uncertainty in the full circle plus the absolute uncertainty in the slot. Our full circle percentage uh, absolute uncertainty is 0 0.03 that we just found. And our slot uncertainty is 0 0.02. We found the 0 0.02 right here in our in, in uh, part three add those two absolute uncertainties you get the absolute uncertainty in the shaded area okay so we have used a macro test screw gauge to find the thickness the thickness is 11.37 millimeters so the slot that the mass that we saw its thickness is 11.37 millimeters now we want to find the density. Density is equal to mass by volume. The mass has been given in the question. The volume we have to find by multiplying the area, cross-sectional area, by the thickness. So the area is 10.4 that we found in our previous part and our thickness is 11.4 millimeters. Mind it. Since our area has been given in centimeter square, our thickness has to be in centimeters. So we have to convert the millimeter value into centimeters. That's why 11.37 has become 1.137. Multiplying gives us the volume, divided the mass by the volume, you get the density. Now, for the percentage uncertainty in our value of the density, we have to add the percentage uncertainty in thickness and the percentage uncertainty in area. Why the percentage uncertainty? Because the uh, relation between the area and the thickness was a multiply, multiplication relation and the uncertain the percentage uncertainty in our mass was negligible so this is only the percentage uncertainty in the volume so how to find the percentage uncertainty in our thickness we don't know uh, uh, we don't know uh, the precision of the micro screw goes here so we can use the half range that is we subtract the minimum value from the maximum value that gives us the range divide that range by two you get the half range divide the half range by your measurement you get and multiply by 100, you get the percentage uncertainty. So that gives us 0.18%. The percentage uncertainty in area is the absolute uncertainty divided by the area itself. The absolute uncertainty, uncertainty was 0 0.05 that we found in our previous part, 0 0.05. Divide that by the actual area value, that is 10.4, and multiply by 100, you get the percentage uncertainty in area. After that, you add the percentage uncertainty in area and the thickness to get the percentage uncertainty in your density value. Now we are suspecting in part D that our material could be made of brass, our material could be brass, which has a density of 8.5. So we found the percentage uncertainty in our density. Let us get the absolute uncertainty by multiplying the percentage uncertainty with our density. So plus minus 0 0.06. This means that our value of the density could vary anywhere from 8.47 minus 0 0.06 or 8.47 plus 0 0.06. So this is the range within which our density is supposed to lie. So if our density is any correct anywhere within this range, then 8.5 since it falls within this range, therefore we, we could conclude that yes, our material could be brass. That is all for today. If you want me to solve some other papers, please comment below and subscribe and press the bell notification button so that you get your notification when I solve your paper. Thank you so much for watching.